Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're delighted to be joined by a really interesting and creative and uh, consequential figure in the world of Illinois philanthropy, Liz Dozier, who is the CEO of a, an important new group, uh, relatively new, called Chicago Beyond. We'll hear a lot about her, her work at Chicago Beyond. Backing up a little bit, Liz has a really interesting background. She was born and raised in the Chicago area. She has an undergraduate degree from Eastern Illinois University um, and studied um, business there, um, has a graduate degree in education management, um, began a career in business, but then uh, had a real calling for education. And she's done everything in the world of education. She's been an elementary school teacher, high school teacher, and a high school principal. And her work as a high school principal at Chicago Fanger High School in the far south side uh, attracted national uh, recognition and 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 study. Um, it was featured prominently in a CNN series called Chicago Land, and Liz did some just amazingly transformative work there. Uh, she was there from 2009 to 2015, and then 2016 uh, launched uh, Chicago Beyond, which is a very creative uh, philanthropy that is working on education and even broader social issues. So Liz is a real a powerhouse, and we're really delighted that she's going to be joining us uh, today from Chicago. So good afternoon, Liz. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm so glad to be here with you. Great. Well, Liz, I was I was watching uh, your TED talk, and uh, you know, I was just settling into my seat, and uh, uh, you mentioned that you know you had had a you're talking about your early years, and you had a nun who had been really important in your life, and you know, I grew up in went to Catholic schools, so I was kind of bracing myself for a familiar story about the importance of nuns in our lives, and uh, heard something that was a little surprising. So tell us about uh, Sister Mary Pat. <laughs> I can tell you all about Sister Mary Pat and that I've known her all my life. Uh, so uh, interesting. I think we all have interesting you know, stories of our lives. This is uh, particularly, I would say, unusual in addition to being interesting. Um, my mother was actually a, a nun for 20 years uh, before she had me. And she um, you know, was a teacher and ministered to um, people who were incarcerated. And the funny kind of part of the story, if, if that's not funny enough, uh, is that she met my dad while she was a nun. And so they had this you know, friendship that spanned over a decade while he was incarcerated. And uh, towards the last, uh, I would say, five years of his incarceration, she actually uh, got pregnant with me and then had to leave the convent uh, and ultimately uh, had me and the, kind of the rest is history. But a very interesting way to uh, come into the world. Right. And as you describe uh, your mom, I mean, she was, I mean, coming from that structured environment, a um, obviously a kind person. I mean, with a, a prison ministry, that takes a you know, an enormous set of skills, but also kind of a disciplinarian. I mean, she was a kind of a law and order sort of uh, nun, wasn't she? Or Yeah. And I think anyone, and it may not be everyone's experience, but I think a lot of people, and, and I was born and raised Catholic. I, you know, went to Catholic school, kindergarten through 12th grade. I had nuns as teachers. And so I think it is a, a somewhat familiar uh, experience for those of us who spent time in Catholic school. Um, you know, sometimes the, the nuns, I mean, there's a there's very strict and regimented ways of, of coming into classrooms, ways of being. And it was interesting, you know, when you think about it, you know, my mom had been a nun for 20 years. You know, she joined the convent when she was just graduated from high school. So she was 18 years old. So from 18 to 38, I mean, that was her life for those 20 years. And so, you know, the fact that she left the convent, you know, was pregnant with me, left the convent and now was now on the outside world. It didn't change those sort of fundamental ways of being, which were very structured, very regimented. You know, if there was an error, there was a consequence, you know, and she really brought that into her, into our home. And it's interesting at, you know, I know now looking back on it, how that really shaped me when I became a teacher and ultimately a principal. It was the very foundation of how I approached my work in a very regimented, you know, very, if there's an action that's wrong, there is a consequence. 
And it's so interesting in that my experience at Finger High School of leading that school and being the principal of that school and ultimately turning it around, which is a whole other story. Um, you know, Finger High School, its students and its teachers taught me some of the greatest lessons of my life, which was in very in, in much opposition to the way my mom had raised me, which is that, you know, it doesn't always work like that. It's not always about an action and a consequence, but rather like how do we approach each other as human beings, knowing we all have flaws and there's things we can learn and, and sort of that more that orientation towards growth. So well, let's talk when, when you went to Eastern Illinois. Did you have a, a what you thought was a clear sense of what you wanted to do, or was it just uh, you know, into an environment where you were just open to possibilities and just went through a, a lot of exploration? You know, I, it's so funny, like, again, going back to, I guess all roads lead back to our parents. Um, my mom, you know, because of her upbringing, her experience of, you know, her own kind of path in life, she, and being an educator, because she was a teacher for, you know, all of her life, in addition to that prison ministry piece that she did uh, up until the day she retired, she really had this sense of like teaching is not where you want to go. You're not going to make enough money. It's going to be a thankless job, which is a very specific way of looking at it. And she really ingrained that into both me and my sister from a very early age. And so I was always drawn to education. I mean, I spent so much time in classrooms, not just as a student, but really, I mean, after school with my mom, she was like, you know, grading papers and meeting with parents. And so I was always drawn to that. But when I went to college, I, you know, had that kind of, I guess, in my subconscious of, well, I can't be a teacher and I can't go into education. And so I just picked business. I'm like, I'll do something opposite from that. That sounded interesting. Um, but was, again, even in college, still drawn to the idea of education. I did, um, you know, all, uh, I worked at summer camps for kids and, you know, all of those types of things that really always brought me back to this idea of education to children, because it was always a place where, you know, I felt joy, I felt a sense of like purpose in, in, in those interactions. And so, you know, ultimately, my life turned out way different. Um, but that was, uh, that was, it wasn't as clear, I would say, in that time of my life at Eastern. Right. Well, then it, 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 you started out in business and then you, you went into education. And I understand you, you're a certified math teacher. Is that right? So how uh, was math always kind of a, the the, uh, the academic subject that uh, intrigued you? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, not even in the least. So I am a, a nationally board certified teacher in mathematics. And ultimately, the reason why I went into that was because I, you know, I, I had definitely had a little bit of a knack for it, um, but I also saw how like my peers, both in college and I was taking like business calculus and other things, um, not only how I had, you know, my own struggles, but how people really struggle with math and almost had like this like math phobia. Simultaneously, I can see like now and even then like how, you know, these kind of basic kind of critical thinking and conceptual skills and mathematics are really applicable in like a larger context in the world. And I wanted to be able to make that accessible to people. Um, and so that was ultimately why I shifted and uh, went into went into mathematics as uh, my sort of entry into into teaching. I once heard a quip, George Will, the, the, the conservative writer, was taught, there was a big debate about school prayer. And he once quipped, he said, as long as there are math tests, there will be school prayer. <laughs> right, exactly. It's not going anywhere. That's not anytime right. fast. Not anytime fast. Well, so Liz, let's talk about, uh, you know, you, so you started out as an elementary school teacher, high school teacher, and then you moved into the world of administration, senior administration. And you, I want to talk a lot about Fanger, but prior to that, you had had a couple, I'm sure, important experiences. One, you were a turnaround strategist at Harper High School, and then also a residential principal at Jones College Prep. Talk about how those experiences provided a foundation, if they did, for what you would later do at um, at Fanger. Yeah, so I, I ultimately I was you know at a school called Young Women's Leadership Charter School, which was here in the city of Chicago, uh, which is now closed. Um, 
but it was, it was a great experience in that the principal at the time, Margaret Small, really opened me up to this idea of, she, she saw something in me. She's like, you're a leader. And so at a very young age, I was like in my early twenties, you know, I was leading like other teachers in, in their practice and kind of how we organize students and, and the such. And so she had encouraged me to apply for um, a program called New Leaders for New Schools, which was a principal prep program that was absolutely incredible. It paid for all of my graduate school work. I had the chance to study at um, Harvard and Boston University and with like educators from across the country. And as part of that program, um, I was placed as a, a resident or as an intern uh, at Jones College Prep under the leadership of Don Friend, who at the time, um, not only was he the principal of Jones College Prep, but he was one of the youngest principals in Chicago Public Schools. And for those of you who might not be as familiar with Jones College Prep, at the time, it was it was a blue ribbon school. It was like, you know, it, it, and it still is like one of the premier schools in Chicago, um, a selective enrollment school that is very diverse, located in the heart of, you know, the South Loop in downtown Chicago. And so I had the chance to really over that year of my residency, learn like what does excellence really look like in these diverse environments? And you know, Don was uh, that was the, the principal. He was always pushing. He was always pushing his teachers. He was always trying to hit the next level for his students of like what does excellent looks like look like. Whether that meant the expansion of like, course options or whether it meant like what does students' voice look like in this env environment for real. And he really made some tough decisions as a leader of that school. And that that influenced me greatly in that, you know, I at the time was, you know, I'm like in my late 20s, getting ready to go into a principalship. And it's this other young principal who's, you know, totally in control of his voice, like pushing the envelope, unafraid, like, and kind of beat to his own drum. You know, he came to school in jeans and a t-shirt, you know, it just, it was, it really resonated with me. Um, and so the, my final year at Jones, it was a one year of residency. Um, Don was tapped by Arnie Duncan, who was the uh, CEO of Chicago Public School at the time, who later obviously went on to all the things that he did with Barack Obama. But um, he had asked Don to essentially lead the turnaround school effort in Chicago. And he Arnie presented this case of like how schools are these particular set of schools that are really struggling on every measure you can imagine from, you know, graduation rate to arrest rates to how kids were reading and asked him to take that on. And, you know, I'm fortunate that Don saw something in me and asked me to come along on that journey, which is how I got to Harper High School, which was identified as one of those kind of struggling schools. And I got to really help build out the academic program there, a lot of the social emotional supports. And if you know anything about the challenges uh, of Harper High School, which for those who aren't familiar is located on the far, on the kind of south side of Chicago midpoint in Inglewood, you know, it had all the challenges that, you know, we talk about oftentimes in urban education. And it was such an experience for me to see sort of like, Jones and what that environment looked like and what those children had access to and the programs and the quality and then to see some of the challenges that Harper was facing and the lack of resources and I mean all the things you imagine right and so those two experiences collectively together in such a short amount of time really informed like my core beliefs which is that you know one this work is like super complex you know it's not you read about these books or see these movies and people just go in, wave a magic wand and fire some teachers and they all of a sudden everything gets better. Not the case. This work is super complex. Um, but ultimately that all children, no matter what their zip code is, no matter what their home you know, status is and, and all those kind of you know, demographic pieces, you know, our children can ultimately be successful. But it is the environment that the adults build inside of that school that is a huge um, piece and component of that. And so it just really informed how I ultimately went into my principalship and really how Chicago Beyond exists today. Well, so let's talk about it for a few minutes, Finger, because you walk into a school with about 1,400 students. Um, graduation rates are, are not good. Dropout rates are high. 300 or so arrests within the school, I think the, the year before you, you entered, um, you know, f lots of violence, you know, occasion, too many deaths, et cetera. 
So, I mean, within a short period of time, within a couple of years, I mean, you and your colleagues affected a fundamental transformation. I mean, what did you do and how did you do it? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it was a wild ride. I'll say that, John. It was a bit of a wild ride, but we eventually got to a really good place. So, you know, I came in as the principal and just to give a, a little more color on those stats, you know, I had uh, 1,500 students who were, you know, at Finger High School, it was at 9 through 12 in the Roseland community, far south side of Chicago. And on average, our graduation rate was 40%, which I just want the audience like sit with that for a second. That means that if you, if you came into Finger as a ninth grader, you were more likely not to graduate than to actually graduate. It's, it's crazy from high school, you know? Um, we had 300 arrests on average inside the school building. That was my first year there. We had 300 and then it was 12 or 15 arrests inside of the school building. We had um, about 40% of our incoming ninth graders reading at like a third, fourth grade reading level or below. Um, fast forward, um, I mean, our dropout rate at that time was 20% too. So on average, one of five kids were dropping out every year. And you fast forward that six years later, by the time I decided to leave, we had 40% of our seniors graduating with college credits. We had doubled our graduation rates from 40% to 80%, arrests virtually down to zero. I mean, like people were coming from as far as you know, Japan, from England, from all over the U.S. to see like what was happening at Finger because we hadn't changed. There was no mass exodus of children. The neighborhood wasn't revamped. Like this really goes back to the kind of how people, people, people look for, like how, how did that take place is that we really centered ourselves on this idea of humanness. And it sounds so very simple, but it's ultimately complex because ultimately, I think a lot in our society, we otherize people. We make it seem like doing for our own children is very different than doing for somebody else's children in a public school environment. And what we knew coming in and, and really got to know over the first like year and a half or so was that our children were in extreme bouts of trauma. The curriculum wasn't culturally competent. We um, didn't have enough like actual like programs and supports for young people, both during school and after school. And so it looked like us showing up as, as if these were our own biological children and figuring out what do we do. And so for us, that meant instituting, you know, everything from anger management and grief counseling into the course of the school day. It meant, you know, having, you know, going out and getting a federal grant that provided us with over a million dollars extra every year to like build additional classes, courses, programs. Um, it meant training teachers on like, what is trauma? What are our children facing? It meant building closer relationships between teachers and staff and 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 um, parents and so that meant actually leaving the walls of the school and going to children's homes you know it also meant some of the things that are a little bit more difficult to talk about that i think most schools don't face across the country um which is you know it meant us you know showing up for families in ways you know whether it meant burying children we had a lot of students died of gun violence you know helping people bury their children showing up um, you know, in ways that are sort of outside the quote unquote context of the school and all of those things together, plus like, like lots more, right? Uh, I could talk for hours about this, but all of those things together, that was that, that was sort of the secret sauce. And those are the things, uh, when I think about our work at Chicago Beyond, the core of that, the DNA of that, that humanness is how we've chosen to just radically reconceptualize what philanthropy is and does. And that, and that shows up in our work at Chicago Beyond. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll have another conversation on Finger because it's it's uh, such an impressive work. But but you you in an essay you wrote in 2015, I stepped away from the field of education and dove into the world of philanthropy. Your co-divers were Mark and Kimbra Walter. Talk about uh, the plunge uh, the three of you have have taken and 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 what the impetus was to create Chicago Beyond and. Um, and just sort of the decision to to invest your time and energy into this enterprise. Yeah. So it was huge credit to Mark and Kimber Walter. I mean, they were, 
and, 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 and people who are in philanthropy now will see this, um, but they were so far ahead of their time. So for context for the audience, Chicago Beyond, which I can't even believe it, is about to be seven years old in a few weeks, which is crazy to me because it doesn't seem like it's been around that long. Um, and so we started these conversations eight years ago. And something that was really important to them, which was, you know, I didn't have really all the context of philanthropy that I do now, but they were ahead of the game and forward thinking in that they wanted someone who was proximate to the work of, of, the, of the issues they were trying to get at. They wanted someone who had actually been there and been in the space and done the work, which if you look at philanthropy, you know, a decade ago, that was not, that definitely was not the case. You know, it was almost like, how far can you get away from the actual issue in terms of your experience and proximity? Okay, you're all over there, great, you go lead philanthropy, you know? And so they were really far ahead of the game and identifying that as being something that's really important to them. And their sort of um, uh, theory uh, behind this was like a person who is most proximate will be, be, be able to better understand the issues and 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 you know problems that are happening, but also better to able to identify others who are working towards solutions. And so you know that was our conversation, and it hasn't you know wavered from that. Um, I'm, I'm happy you know philanthropy overall is moving now in that direction since 2020, uh, over the last three years or so. But it really was core to how Chicago Beyond started and what the intention was. Um, be how uh, how Chicabian started. Well, I, I want to read a couple sentences from you have a white paper on your website on what you call whole philanthropy. And I want to read a couple sentences and maybe have you expand on it. Um, sure. it, 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 it reads, despite decades of, quote, defining the problem and implementing, quote, solutions, we are left with minimal, long lasting results. It's tempting to attribute these failures to societal forces, especially given the growing awareness of how structural racism and inequality shape and distort young lives. But as a critique of philanthropy, as a, as a critique of philanthropy underscores, a sector grounded in charity rather than justice is itself a party to these forces. Traditional philanthropy exacerbates these inequities. It seeks to alleviate by operating in a way that draws sharp lines between givers and receivers, haves and have-nots, appraisers and the appraised. Talk about the concept of whole philanthropy. Yeah. So I wouldn't be a good founder and CEO if I didn't actually show the audience what okay. it looked like and to tell them they could get this at chicagobeyond.org. They can download it. Um, but, you know, whole philanthropy was our best attempt to articulate our orientation to the work. So, you know, all those things that I mentioned, the DNA of Finger High School and like what we've come to understand by being in the philanthropic space, it was our best attempt to articulate um, how we show up as an organization rooting ourselves in, you know, connectedness and consciousness and this idea of doing things with people and not for them. And that is a fundamental, from my, my perspective, and I think our perspective as an organization, it's a very different way than what philanthropy has traditionally shown up. And I'm talking, you know, pre-2020. 2020 was a marker, I think, in philanthropy where people realized you know, things have to shift. And so we're, we're, I think in the last three years in the uh, sort of coming to terms with like how we shift. Um, and this came out a little bit before, before the pandemic, but it, it roots in this idea of we have to show up in ways that are about, it's not an us versus them. It is not somehow that, you know, everyone who has a checkbook or who sits in a fill in fact, seat. These are the brains. And then everybody who actually does the work on the ground, this is the brawn. And somehow the brains tells the brawn like what to do because they somehow know better because they've made more money. And it, it whole philanthropy just, you know, obliterates that and says it's not a us versus them. It's all of us together. Again, rooting back in that idea of humanness, which is really what philanthropy is supposed to be about. I mean, that's the origin, the Greek origin of the word. It's 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 uh, you know love of humankind, 
Um, and the other big principle within it is around this idea of this is not charity work. This is justice work. And so oftentimes in philanthropy, you know, it, it's it's about giving someone some pittance of something and then we pat ourselves on the back because we feel good because we made the large donation to do XYZ program instead of a very different orientation which says, no, there are some inequities that are existing that exist in our world, in our country, in our city. And how do we show up again as a collective, as the that idea of it's not us and them, but how do we show up for each other and do this in more of the vein of the justice work? And so um, whole philanthropy goes through ways in which to do this. I'll just give one really quick one. Um, we talk about in terms of our, our, our core principles, you know, we talk about this idea of uh, how we should measure impact. Now, typically in philanthropy, we're counting numbers. We gave out this amount of money. We served, you know, 10,000 kids. We did, it's very like numeric based in terms of impact. And what we question in whole philanthropy is we say, actually, you know, how should we measure impact? Well, here's how we think of it at Chicago Beyond. We prioritize, like, actually, like, what is important instead of like, searching for some perfect answer that's validated by some randomized control trial that's doing a thing. Um, and we we center voices that are really closest to the work. And we, you know, don't just look at like, you know, here's what's easy to measure, but like really know here are the key questions that really need to be answered. Um, and I, I see it in whether it's our recent investment of over $3 million in an organization called Life After Justice, which is led by an incredible man, Jared Adams, who was wrongfully convicted and uh, at the age of 18 and spent 10 years in prison before he was exonerated and ultimately released. He went on to become an attorney um, and he is now in three states um, just, I mean, taking the system by storm in terms of fighting for people and ultimately trying to create like legal precedent so that the same thing that happened to him doesn't happen to others. And the unique part about this is that he's also looking at what is like aftercare look like? So what does it look like when you've served multiple years in prison, decades often for a lot of these um, men he's working with, what does it look like for your own healing and well-being? And so his, his whole you know, practices around the legal aspect and the aftercare. And so up until Chicago Beyond's $3.2 million investment in Jarrett, his largest single investment was approximately $2,500, period. We saw that and instead of saying, whoa, does, does Jared have a randomized control trial to prove the thing, to make the thing make sense so we can all invest in it? It's like, no, let's use our common sense Let's get to know him. Let's see his work, what he's done. Because he was already, you know, funding this himself out of his own pocket. And let's make a big investment, a big stake in what this is. And, and that's that's what whole philanthropy is all about. Um, it, it is it's rooted in, in exactly that. Well, and, and I think one of your talks, maybe it was in that book or, or a talk that you gave, you talked about some of the invisible traps that philanthropy confronts. And yeah. I loved one of them, which you called the Thunderdome mentality, um, and another one is deficit-based language, but talk about those two, if you would, um, as, as traps that uh, philanthropy oftentimes uh, stumbles into. Yeah, um, I think the, I shouldn't say the funniest, that sounds so trite, I don't mean to make it seem like that, but, you know, there is sort of this, and we Chicago Beyond has done it too, I mean, knowing all the things I know, and even having the experience of being on the other end as a receiver of philanthropy as a principal, I felt the Thunderdome, but then when I got in the position, I recreated the Thunderdome. And the Thunderdome is essentially this idea of, you know, what typically happens in philanthropy is like, there's some all call, you know, something where, you know, proposals are to be submitted, or there's this kind of mentality of, you know, every organization is almost like against one another to get funding. And it feels very Thunderdome-ish. Like it's the, it's the person or group or nonprofit organization that can tell the best, worst story about a community. That's who gets the funding. And you know, we did that at Chicago Beyond. It was one of our one of our missteps early on. Is we did the all call process and we mimic some of those same things that I'm talking about that I just talked about that Thunderdome, and ultimately. 
you know, through our own reflection, our own time in the space and their own, our own examining of our practices came to stop that. And so we don't do that anymore, but it's a practice in philanthropy that is rampant and that ultimately from our perspective doesn't get us to the best results. It ultimately like rips and, and is, I think, destructive to communities overall and kind of pulling people together, essentially like kind of almost like tearing them apart and, and, and siloing folks. So that's the Thunderdome mentality. And I think the other one you mentioned was the deficit language. Yeah. Yeah, which is, which is right along the idea of telling the best worst story. So, you know, let's not frame it in terms of assets. We'll frame it in terms of deficits because that's what'll get us the money. And that's not the fault of the nonprofit. I, I argue that is our fault as philanthropy for setting up the conditions so that people have to tell the best worst story. And so we've at Chicago Beyond um, through our work in whole philanthropy and other things that we've done with our partners have tried to reframe that and start with like, what are all the assets and the ways you're making progress and tell us about the greatness of your community because the communities that we work in are great. <laughs> the people who are in the communities are great. The leaders are great. They are, they have ideas and knowledge and things to build upon. And we need to honor that and be real about that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that, you know, the past couple of years, I feel like philanthropy has begun to examine that former practice and it's really aiming towards uh, something different. Well, and then your strategy has two prongs, which are really kind of interestingly different. The first is, you know, big systemic work. Um, and then the second is, as you say, support hyper-local early stage initiatives. So talk about those those two prongs of your your overall strategy. Yeah, it's it's pretty simple. I think as I as I think about the work, I think of it, and I'm I'm a visual learner, so I, I think in terms of pictures. So I'll just kind of paint the really quick picture of the spectrum that I see. When I first came into philanthropy and I was trying to understand it, I saw that there's like all these different types of nonprofit organizations, everything from you know, a hyper local kind of mom and pop, like, you know, couple people doing a thing that's not even a 501c3. It's like an idea. So like, you know, your smaller kind of 501c3s to more established organizations. So um, for those of you who are in Chicago, this would be like, um, uh, you know, your, your local kind of, um, you know, localized, you know, nonprofits who can work within a school and you have your more established organizations like One Goal and you have your things that are more institutionalized, like, you know, After School Matters and these really big organizations. Um, and then you have your systems level work, which is like, you know, I think Chicago Public Schools, that type of stuff. And for what I realized is that in philanthropy along that spectrum, Philanthropy feels very comfortable, and I'm speaking in broad terms, right? It's not inclusive of everybody um, or every institution, but but tends to feel very comfortable in that midpoint. They feel very comfortable giving to the established organization that has the board, that has the proven track record, and or or the thing that is the big conglomerate that has been around for 50 years, you know, that's done a thing that has, you know, sites all over the country. They feel very comfortable in those spaces. But where people often don't feel as comfortable in philanthropy is digging into those ends of the spectrum. So in systems level change. So, you know, thinking about, you know, organization like Chicago Public Schools or the Cook County Jail or, you know, the foster care system, these really big, knotty, like system level things that actually impact hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and the other side of the spectrum, people don't feel comfortable. And it's like those really hyper local, like, oh, geez, what is that even? What are they doing? I don't know what they're doing. Like that thing, you know? And so Chicago Beyond, right around like year three, we just decided we're like, hey, you know, like, here's the real unique opportunity to make changes and shifts. It's in getting in the messiness of that and figuring out a pathway in that that ultimately leads towards freedom. Cause that's, that's huge for us, Chicago beyond. We're like, how can every person be free? And by free, I mean, like you just be able to access the, the best and highest levels of themselves, you know, and that's through like, a, that's through all the things that we're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, that was, a, that was a big thing for us. Maybe a strategic move to hit those opposite ends of, of the spectrum. 
Well, let's talk about a couple of your programs specifically. And one that, that grabbed me uh, as I was reading through your, your materials is a leader in residence. Talk about that if you would. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. So we started this, oh gosh, time is just flying, almost like five years ago now. And the idea was, you know, the Walters who you mentioned earlier, Mark and Kimber Walter, they gave me an incredible opportunity. I mean, just when I think about, you know, I was coming out of a school, like I'll, I knew school, I knew education, I knew kids, I knew community. I didn't know anything about running some multi-million dollar a year. Like effort. I had no, no clue in terms of like what philanthropy was, but they believed in my knowledge base and proximity to the work. And right around year two, as we were talking about like, what are the veins, uh, what are the ways we want to approach systems level work? We started to think about as a team, like how to sort of get at that in more ways than just funding Chicago public schools or, you know, like how do you really get at that? And so we had this idea to almost mimic what the Walters did for me, which is to say, like, who's out there doing really awesome, impactful, you know, intentional work and how can we support them both through through a variety of resources, not just financial resources, but through all different types of growth support and all these things, how can we um, support them to do that? And so we started our leader in residence program, which was, you know, very much mimics like a fellowship um, where the person actually comes into Chicago beyond and we support them grow an idea. So our first leader in residence was Nika Jones Tapia, for those of you who aren't familiar, she ran the second largest jail in the country. Uh, she was the warden at Cook County Jail and here in Chicago and did some incredible work around mental health and transition and like really showed up again, rooted in Chicago beyond value of like, you know, despite people being incarcerated, like how do you think about recovery and healing and humanness, all the things that we believe. And so it was a natural way that, you know, we linked and Nika has gone on to with, she's still with Chicago Beyond, now full-time at Chicago Beyond, but has gone on to lead um, huge reforms at Cook County Jail through Chicago Beyond for how parents visit their children. She's actually in San Francisco today with uh, other of my teammates, uh, working um, at uh, in, in with other jails across the country along the lines of this work. And so our, our most recent leader in residence is Valerie, um, Janine Valerie Logan, who um, is doing some incredible work around maternal health and who is opening the first Southside Birth Center. Uh, she has an incredible story too. So again, identifying similar to what Mark and Kimber did for me, who are great people who get the thing and how do you give them that extra fuel and push to do the thing and kind of get out of their way, you know, support them you can and get out of their way. Tell us about the program called The Collective. What is that? Yeah, so that was a program we launched actually right before COVID. So we've only had one cohort of, of folks there. And the idea there was we have, and, and anyone who's, you know, been in Chicago for two seconds knows that, it, you know, we're a complex city and things are complicated, a lot of the issues that we face, but there are people who are working inside of communities every day, whether it's through art or whether it is through like physical movement or, I mean, a variety of like, like uh, programs and institutes that people like do in their communities. And, you know, our thing was, how do we give those folks a bit of a lift, right? Like they, they've got a kind of an idea it's not at the stage of like, you know, a Nika, you know, kind of idea or what Janine is up to with the birthing center, but they're doing some amazing work. And so, you know, the collective was designed to give those folks access to our space. We have an incredible space in the West Loop of Chicago um, to be able to hold programming, to be able to gather, to have meeting space. Um, it gave them, a you know, a small uh, scholarship to be able to, you know, fund different, you know, programs and interest areas of their own, and really to create that connective tissue amongst them, who didn't know each other, and to see what could come out of that. So I'm um, really proud of that as well. It started right before the pandemic. So I feel like it, it didn't get the quite the lift we wanted it to, because, you know, I, you know, a couple months later, we were essentially like, you know, all in our homes and on Zoom, um, but another great uh, program of Chicago Beyond's. Well, let's talk about this guidebook that you've assembled called Why Am I Always Being Researched? And 
And just a wonderful genesis, I guess, a student, uh, you're doing a project with maybe a University of Chicago, uh, uh, kind of a collaborative effort, and you you were meeting with a student who said, why am I always being researched? So give us a little bit of the backstory and then what that developed into. Yeah, I wish I could hold up my why am I always being researched, but I actually <laughs> don't have it uh, on me right now. But anybody can go to chicagobeyond.org and you can download a, a, a copy of that um, book. But you know, it's, you know, we are, we do believe in that idea of proximity. It's, it's, it's who we are. And so, um, you know, it, it, how that kind of original, the genesis of that idea came about, you know, Chicago Beyond had been this reflective phase of, of saying to ourselves, like, you know, what is it that we believe around research? We had begun to see some of the flaws in research. And right around that time, we were on the west side of Chicago and getting ready to begin a randomized controlled trial with the University of Chicago uh, crime lab at the time, crime education lab at the time. And uh, UFC along with like us was like in the room and, you know, um, having participants who were going to participate in the research study actually sign off. And there was a young man, he was over 18. Um, so he wasn't with a parent and, you know, we we're kind of breaking down like here's the, what the study is going to do, here's the process is, here's what we're trying to get that, you know, all, all the kind of usual things like, you know, researchers do before they get started to explain to someone, you know, kind of what they're signing off on. And it was such a profound moment in our organization's trajectory because the young man, Jante, who's actually on the cover of Why Am I Always Being Research, you know, he listened to the whole spiel, was like, you know, really attentive and kind of tuned in and you know, when asked, uh, you know, to Jante, like, you know, do you have any questions? You know, Jante kind of pauses, like looks around and his question was like, why am I always being researched? And he said, you know, this is the third time in this last several years I've been asked to sign off on a form like this. And he's like, I just don't understand why am I always being researched? And what really happens with all this research? I've never seen anything happen different, you know, and I'm, he's like, I'm assuming this is going on for a long time. I mean, oh, right. I mean, that is the question, you know, when we think about these huge, huge, and we have them in Chicago, you know, huge research institutions that are, you know, being funded tens of millions of dollars every single year you know, and this might be controversial, but so let it be. Um, what are we really learning that's different that, you know, we can't find out that we don't already know it's not in some white paper that we can't find somewhere or that we can't in fact get from people who are most proximate to the work. We have this almost like fetishizing of like research and, and numbers and data and this propensity to lean in there in a way that I think is really unhealthy. And I'm specifically talking about research in communities. I'm not talking about medical research and, you know, not none of that. I'm talking about this type of stuff, particularly when it comes to impoverished, you know, communities in poverty, particularly when it comes to Black communities, Brown communities. We, we love to conduct a research study. And, you know, Jante's question, why am I always being researched? That was the impetus for what we ultimately put out, which was a guidebook of which we collaborated with over 200 um, nonprofits from across the country, uh, multiple research institutions gave their feedback to, to, to put this together. So I don't claim that Chicago Beyond like used all knowledge that came out of our head, just from hundreds of people put it together. And the, and, the, and the idea is whether you're a researcher, a funder, or a nonprofit, the book is in three sections, you can turn to that section and understand ways in which you can do your work because the research isn't going to stop. It's a, it's a whole industrial complex and money game behind that. Um, research in our communities likely will not stop, but how can we do it in a way that is more equitable, that honors people's voice, and that really gets to the truth um, as opposed to the next white paper that sits on a shelf that makes like, you know, this like marginal change that people oftentimes don't even see. Very interesting. Liz, we have some questions that have been emailed in. And the first one um, asks, how can your programs be replicated downstate? 
That's a great question. I, I you know, I, I think every community is different, you know, and so I, 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 when I think about whether it's like, you know, in Chicago or in Atlanta or New York or LA or downstate or like in Montana, wherever the thing is, it's to, in my mind, less about the idea of replication of a program as it is the core tenets of what Chicago Beyond believes, which is like, you know, how do you show up, you know, honoring and trusting the knowledge of people who are like most impacted and of community organizations? Um, how do you show up in a way that is very, um, humid, human in nature. And so when I think about the idea of what's happening downstate, it really is, you know, what is happening in communities? Who are the pe who are the people in those communities that people turn to in terms of programmatically of what's really working for people? And then once that's identified, how does the philanthropic community or others within that region of um, the the state, how 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 are people like really supporting that with like real resources, not, you know, um, some pittance of something in the charity-esque mindset, really major, major um, donations and opportunities for those organizations to actually to grow. Another question is, how does a person who is a disruptor work through periods of uncertainty, difficulty, and confusion? How, how did you, how do you keep, you know, plowing ahead when there's so much ambiguity and, and complexity to your work? I don't know, John, I'm still trying to figure that question out. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's what we're all in, right? I mean, whether it's in philanthropy or at a university or in life in general or at corporate job, A, there's as human beings, you know, we all have a certain level of things that are very certain in our lives and a certain level of things that are uncertain. And I think when it gets really topsy-turvy for us as individuals, myself included, is when there's too much uncertainty. You've got to have kind of like a balance. And also you can't have too much certainty because that gets super boring, you know? And so there's like this, there's this kind of nice mix of certainty and uncertainty, I think that is 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 good for us as like humans that keep us like motivated and inspired. Um, but when I've found for myself, when I've found times of like high uncertainty, you know, I think. For, for me, what I've always done is sort of root back in the why of this work, which, you know, goes back to, you know, my students, it goes back to the Savans and the Jasons and the Briannas and seeing some of the challenges that they faced and some of they've been overcome, some that they haven't. Um, and it's rooting back in what's real. Like this is a, for me, this is a real life or death thing that we're doing. It's not sitting in some ivory tower and, you know, you know, gazing at the problems and, you know, giving some like, you know, talk about it. Like there are real people who are like not here and dead because of consequences of how our society is structured and how money moves and where people find value in communities. And so that for me keeps me like moving and going and pushing through in those high times of uncertainty. And then also, you know, frankly, I pray I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and I, you know, I believe in God. And I oftentimes when things are totally make absolutely zero sense, you know, I oftentimes turn to prayer. Great. Um, a question about just the funding. It says, when you started out initially, was it difficult securing grants, private funding, and other support? I know you had, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, your your uh, co collaborators provided the initial funding. Is that the core of it, or are there additional funds that are part of your uh, your overall resources? Yes. So we are, a, we're a family foundation. And so we don't uh, accept any, um, you know, donations or things um, outside of, you know, our, our own coffers, if you will, um, but always do direct those resources if because people do, they want to support the cause and they want to oftentimes donate money. And so what we've done consistently throughout our existence is to be able to direct those resources directly to our nonprofit partners or those who we know are in the space who are doing really incredible work. And I feel very fortunate that Chicago Beyond is set up in a way that allows us to do that because it's not typically um, uh, what a person in my position does. They have to essentially fundraise year over year over year to make a thing happen. And so I feel very fortunate that we can um, really focus on the task at hand, which is the work of our communities and supporting it. 
Well, it seems to me that you've, you've in your career so far, and it's obviously in its early phases, I mean, you've had two really different challenges. One, you know, we'll use Fenger as an example of, you know, focus tightly on an institution, a high school, and turning it around and seeing, you know, just the tangible results that, uh, you know, have been cited. And then what you're doing now with Chicago Beyond is more systematic and, and, and wider scoped. I mean, talk about these two I mean, in terms of just kind of satisfaction of turning around a specific school versus doing more structural work. Oh, yeah, it's totally different. <laughs> so it was actually really hard for me, John. It was really hard. The first couple of years, kind of the first three years implanted were extremely hard. Um, and I thought about, like, is this even for me? It's, it's you know, to go from a career where I was in the mix of the work with people, with families, with community, with students, like very like, pro I mean, right in the mix, you know, very proximate to go to a, a, a world in which is, it's very much removed, right? In terms of like, I definitely, we still interact with people and we're out in community events, but it's different when you can point to that so-and-so and that so-and-so and you have relationships at a very, very deep, deep level because you're, you're essentially in schools, you're doing life with people every day. You're literally doing life with them. And this is this is it from a different vantage point. Um, so that work as a school principal is extremely satisfying and gratifying more in the immediate um, of being able to make a decision and see a thing change. And this and in, in the role of, of Chicago Beyond is satisfying in a whole different way. You know, when I think about Life After Justice, which is the organization I mentioned earlier, led by um, Jared Adams. And please, I think we should really go look up Life After Justice, an incredible organization. When I think about what Jared is trying to do and the fact that he was having to essentially bootstrap this effort by himself and his biggest donation was $2,500. And he had gotten so far along, he had offices in three states and he was, I mean, he was doing this, he was funding this on his own. Um, again, like bootstrapping it, but doing it. When I think about what that $3.2 million is doing for him, um, and what it's going to ultimately do for the country in terms of this legal precedence that he is setting is there's actually a case that will be seen before the Virginia Supreme Court uh, where two men who, uh, again, wrongfully convicted, but yet are still in jail uh, and are still in prison. When I think of what Jared's work is getting ready to do for not only those two men, but the legal precedent that will be set that is satisfying on an, a whole different level, you know, and I'm not as close to, I'm not, you know, in the courtroom and I'm not, I don't know the, the two men for the case um, that he's, uh, we'll see before the Virginia Supreme Court, but that is satisfying a whole different level because now we're talking about the ripple effects of the masses, whereas at a school, you're definitely talking about the ripple effects of like thousands, right? Because it's the kids, it's their families and all of that. But now we're talking on a national level, and that is that is satisfying um, in a very deep and profound way when I think about the legacy of not only my work, but the work of Chicago Beyond. Well, we, we have a, a number of students on this call, and I, I always like to ask guests, you know, what uh, what have you learned in your career? What what have you learned that you would like to have been able to tell your 20 year old self as uh, you are launching your career? Mm. You know, I've I've always felt this uh, since I had a very young age, and I think I've le sometimes I've leaned into this, and sometimes I've not. And particularly now, I'm I'm really leaning in, and it's this idea. And I would tell this to the students as as well. Like you've got one life to live, and I I remember hearing people. I had a when I was a teacher, there was a a. a a, a woman who was a almost like a she kind of ran the detention rooms an older woman like in her 70s and at the time I made like seventeen thousand dollars a year as like a like a like a teacher teacher aide you know at this Catholic school and he was really struggling and would you know didn't really have money to buy food I mean it was like it was a pretty bad time of my life and in many ways financially and I would go into the thing where she held attention. I would sit with her and sometimes she's like, bring me food and I'd be able to eat with her. And I remember her name was Miss McCollum. And I remember Miss McCollum telling me, she's like, Liz, it goes by so fast. 
She said, don't waste time. You've got one life. And you know, I'm, you know, 22 years old. I'm like, ah, it's, I don't know what, and, you know, making this thing, you know, of like, you know, 70 might as well have seemed like it was, we're talking about 10 millenniums from now, you know, it's like, that's never going to happen. I'm never going to thirties. What are you talking about? Forties, fifties, it's not going to happen. Um, but she would always push me on that. You got one life to live. You better go after whatever the hell you want and not waste time. And, you know, as I've gotten older, uh, along the journey, I think I've realized that more and more. And so when I think about your students and just students in general, it's like, you know, I know that you're young and I totally get it. And I promise you, your time will come. And so don't hold back and wait to do the next thing or feel like you have to follow a certain path or you have to, you know, like you don't, you can be doing, you know, thing one today and say tomorrow, you know what, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to switch and do that. And then switch it again and switch it again and go travel and do your thing because we just don't know how much time that we ultimately have. And we deserve to be happy and we deserve to be fulfilled, and we deserve to live the life that we've imagined um, as individuals. And so I think that's a really important overall lesson. Good. Well, let me ask you finally, on your Twitter account, uh, you're talking about things you enjoy, and you list three things. You said good food, travel, and yoga. So let's start out with good food. Is there a place in Chicago you would recommend that? uh... Oh, my gosh. There are so many good places. I mean, I, I'm, I've been craving this. I mean, this is probably like whatever to most people, but I love Portillo's. I don't know if you're a Portillo's fan, but I love a good like Portillo's like hamburger. I love a good hot dog. I love a good beef sandwich from Portillo's as like one of my favorites. Love Giordano's pizza. And there's all the, obviously all like the, you know, very like fine dining restaurants in Chicago. And those are amazing too. But when, I, when it comes, when it comes to like a really good, just like everyday, like, go pick up. I'd say Portillo's is one of my favorites. And what about travel? Do you have a particular place that is you go in your head when you need to relax or you can go physically when uh, you have an opportunity? Yeah, I, you know, I really love Puerto Rico. Um, I I have found a, a friend of mine has a, a, a home um, uh, about two hours outside of like San Jose on the beach coast. And I love Puerto Rico. I love Machu Picchu. I've traveled to China and Israel and kind of all over the, all over the globe. And I just think travel is some of the, that, that act of going away actually brings us closer to who we are. And so I love a good beach and, a uh, uh, you know, just being in different cultures. And yoga. Yeah. Are you, are you a yoga person? I am I'm actually a certified yoga teacher. Oh wow! So, uh, but this is way before the pandemic. Um, probably a few years before I became a certified uh, yoga instructor, and so um, yoga is one of my passions. Uh, I haven't, and that's so much doing it these days. I've been finding myself like traveling for work and a whole bunch of things, but it is definitely one of my passions. A good hot yoga class is like cleansing for the soul. Great. Well, Liz, thank you for such a terrific conversation. It's been interesting. And and for those in the audience who would like to follow the work of Chicago Beyond uh, more closely to read some of the materials, what, uh, I know your website is terrific and you're, you're, I'm sure you're active in social media. How can they best follow the work of Chicago Beyond? Yeah, I would say go to chicagobeyond.org. And from there, you can get access to why am I always being researched, whole philanthropy. You'll see our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn handles, um, ways to get involved. You'll get to learn more about our partners. All that information can be found at chicagobeyond.org. Okay, great. Well, Liz, at some point very soon, we'd like to coerce you or not coerce you, uh, persuade you to come to Carbondale. We could even maybe arrange a a detour to Eastern Illinois so you can see your alma mater. But I think people here would just be thrilled to learn about, you know, just your remarkable story and just the important work you're doing to to reimagine philanthropy, which, um, you know, the, the concepts that you're embracing in Chicago, as you suggested earlier, can be applied to smaller communities throughout the state. Oh, thank you so much, John. I would love to do that. And thank you so much for having me today and for everyone who took time out of their day to tune in. Thank you. I know that you could be doing many other things. So I appreciate you being here with us in this conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. Take care, John. Great, thanks. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. We will have uh, this video with Liz 
on our website in the next couple of days. Show it to family and friends. Uh, pass on the remarkable work that Liz is doing. And thank you for supporting the Institute. Keep following us on social media platforms and on our website. And we'll do all that we can to keep the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.